Good evening and welcome to this very special lecture presentation by Professor Ruth ben Giat of New York University. My name is Bill Bowman and I am a member of the uh, both the International and Global Studies Program in the History Department here at Gettysburg College. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor ben Giat this evening and welcome her to our institution via this webinar format. I also take a moment at the beginning of the presentation to thank the various departments and programs um, at, the, at the college that are sponsoring her talk and presentation this evening, including the International and Global Studies Program, the Jewish Studies Program, Italian Studies, the Political Science Department, the History Department, and the Eisenhower Institute, which focuses on public policy and related fields at Gettysburg. At New York University, Professor Ben Giat is a member of both the History and Italian Studies Departments. Over a long and distinguished career, she has published several major works, contributed to numerous important collaborative efforts, and participated in numerous panels and conferences. Much of her early work focused on the history of Italian fascism. As a scholar interested in multidisciplinary disciplinary approaches to the past, she explored and analyzed Italian fascist film, literature, and propaganda. Two of her important works are Fascist Modernities, Italy 1922 to 1945, which was published by the University of California Press, and Italian Fascism's Empire Cinema, which was published by the University of Indiana Press. She has also published extensively on the history of culture, colonialism, and immigration in the modern period. All in all, she is the author, editor of seven books and numerous articles and reviews. Over the course of her career, Professor Ben Giat has also become a public intellectual and has done a great amount of work in the, in the world of public, uh, uh, excuse me, political commentary by way of writing for and appearing on several media outlets, including CNN. With the publication of her newest book, Strongman, Mussolini to the Present, which I'm holding up here, Strongman, Mussolini to the Present. Uh, her work has been featured on or commented on in a, a host of forums and her public profile has expanded once again and considerably so. Strongman was for a time an Amazon bestseller and has made Professor Ben Giat one of the world's leading scholars of modern authoritarianism, which is the subject of her talk tonight, Authoritarian Models of Government. Her presentation will last approximately 40 to 45 minutes. and It'll be followed by a question and answer session. Uh, those of you on the webinar can simply uh, put questions in through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer them the best we can in about a 30 to maybe 40 minute session at the end of her presentation, her formal remarks. Professor Ben Giat, a very, very, very warm welcome to Gettysburg College. Thank you, thank you so much. And I know that many uh, different departments and entities um, uh, supported my uh, talk here tonight. So I'd like to thank International and Global Studies, and political science and Italian studies, ciao a tutti, and uh, history uh, and Jewish studies and the Eisenhower Institute. And I especially like to uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Bill Bowman of History and International Global Studies for um, helping to uh, help making this happen. So, so thanks to everyone for coming um, and uh, so I'm gonna talk about authoritarian models of government. Uh, the talk is taken um, partly from my book, Strongmen, which uh, Professor Bowman showed you the snappy cover. I was very pleased with, with the cover, uh, how it came out. And ours truly is the age of the strongman leader. And we're in a very fateful period actually because um, the latest uh, Freedom House studies and VDEM Institute studies show that authoritarianism is increasing around the world. Uh, over 60% of the population now lives under some form of illiberal rule. But 
another study by the International Center of uh, Strategic Studies shows that protest uh, in 2000, right before, until the uh, pandemic hit, protest was also at a record high. And of course, these two things are in relation. The more authoritarianism spreads, the more that there's going to be mass protests to um, resist it and to try and counter it. So it's a very, it's a very interesting, fateful time that we're living through. And when I refer to the strongman leader, I'm using this term to refer to a subset of authoritarians. They are heads of state who damage or destroy democracy, but they also use masculinity as a tool of political legitimacy. And such rulers now govern in Turkey, and in India, and in Russia, and Brazil. So some of the most geopolitically important and populous nations in the world. And I wrote my book, uh, which is a history of the evolution of authoritarianism over a hundred years, because I really felt it was time to look back uh, over this history. And also because as a historian, I was concerned that we're in a period of intense revision of the history of authoritarianism, um, by including revision by authoritarians that is designed to make themselves look good and minimize or whitewash the violence that they and their predecessors cause. So when I teach World War II, which I do regularly at NYU, I make sure to tell my students when we cover the Nazi Soviet pact that if we were in Russia, I wouldn't be allowed by law to mention it. I could go to jail or be fined if I mentioned the Nazi Soviet pact. It's illegal to do that now. And there's also, um, the attempt to kind of whitewash the history of other forms of right-wing authoritarianism. So you have t-shirts that you can buy on Amazon. I'll show you a slide from a Proud Boys rally uh, in the States that say Pinochet did nothing wrong, referring to the Chilean dictator. So on the one hand, such a t-shirt says did nothing wrong is justifying the violence, saying he didn't do anything wrong in killing leftists. On the other hand, is saying he didn't do anything wrong because uh, he, he, he perhaps he never did anything of that sort. So, and when we Google leaders like Mussolini, we still often see their own images, their own regime's propaganda that comes up, the old black and white photos. Those are the way that those leaders wanted to be seen. We don't see what happens. For example, when we see pictures of the leader at a rally, that's a very common thing that will come up when you, when you Google fascism, right? We don't see what happens to the people who didn't show up to those rallies. You would get a, a postcard. And if you, if you didn't go, the, the police would visit your house. And so people had to become props for their spectacles. And so I wanted to kind of draw the curtain back on authoritarianism, both the leaders and their styles of rule, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight, and also uh, the people who lived with them and under them and, and against them. And, and finally, uh, writing this as an American, this seemed like uh, a more urgent project given the beginning of the, the Trump presidency and the arrival of Trump on the political scene, who I saw as somebody uh, having authoritarian instincts um, and, and using similar tactics. So it's actually the first book to put Trump in the context of a century of rule. And really the accent is how it changes over a hundred years. So the book is structured in three periods. You have the fascist period, you have the age of military coups, and you have what I call the new authoritarian age where rulers come to power via elections and then they manipulate elections to stay there. And it's having one party states like you have in China or in North Korea is less common today. So <clears throat> often you leave a pocket of opposition, uh, you hold elections, but you rig those elections, you use fraud, you use intimidation. So you, you have the appearance of democracy, but in fact, it's kind of rigged in your favor. So, so that's an important, um, very important distinction uh, that pure fascist states, uh, the one party dictatorship, dictatorship are, are much less common today. 
And the core of the book is about the authoritarian playbook, um, the, in, the tools and tactics that have stayed They've stayed pretty, you know, much the same over a century. Corruption and violence and the myth of national greatness and propaganda and machismo. And also the tools that people use to resist and how and how they get them out of office. So um, to start from the beginning, it's it's amazingly the same over a century. An individual appears on the political scene who seems to stand for something new and grand. And he's skilled in the art of self-presentation and emotional manipulation. He captures the hearts and minds of millions, telling them he will clean up the country. And soon a personality cult forms around him and he's embraced as a savior who will bring order to a disordered world. And when we look at, uh, to, to stick with the beginning, why, uh, what are the times in a society when uh, strongmen leaders uh, appeal? It's often after a country has had a lot of social change, for example, after World War I, um, where you have uh, secularization, it could be workers' rights, it could be gen progress and gender equity, it could be racial emancipation. And all of these factors uh, are, leave some people overjoyed and other people feeling their status and their authority is threatened. And that is when over and over again, Spain in the 1930s and, and the fascist regimes, America in 19, uh, 2016 after eight years of Barack Obama. And these are, these are uh, sets of circumstances that recur. So they're embraced as, as I said, saviors who will bring order, law and order. And yet, day after day, they court the most extremist and criminal elements in society. And many of these men come into power either with a criminal record, like Hitler and Mussolini, or under investigation, like Berlusconi in Italy, and Putin and Trump. And so the glamorization and legitimation of lawlessness starts early in authoritarian societies um, and come to occupy an ever larger place in the, in the political culture that they create. And the essence of authoritarianism is to legitimize lawlessness. So you have the rhetoric of law and order and the legitimation of lawlessness. And, and we'll come back to this. Now, even as they're doing this, such leaders use the myth of national greatness very effectively. They enchant people with a utopian vision of what the nation might become. This could be uh, a racial utopia like with the Nazis. It could be a kind of um, grandeur in expanded uh, territorial acquisitions. So there's always a forward, uh, it's a forward looking vision of how the nation will be great. But, and this is very important, at the same time, they're channeling nostalgia. And the slogan is never just make the nation great, it's make the nation great again. <laughs> so what's this again? Um, often it involves fantasies of reviving a lost empire. So uh, uh, Francisco Franco was obsessed with, you know, the, the, having the Spanish empire. Um, Mussolini, he had the most firm grounding. He talked about reviving the Roman Empire, and he did a lot to, uh, uh, he had Roman excavations, all kinds of things that was known as the ideology, ideology of Romanness. So he was reviving the Roman Empire. In Turkey, Erdogan today talks about reviving the Ottoman Empire. Now with Trump, it was a vaguer fantasy about returning to an age when male authority was secure, people of color uh, and workers knew their places and women, of course. So I'm gonna uh, go over to my, um, my PowerPoint. So here's the, um, to go back to the first, in the introduction, this was from a Proud Boys rally. And you have the T-shirt, very popular in the global right, and there are versions in Spanish and Portuguese. Pinochet did nothing wrong. So, <clears throat> so let, if we talk about personality cults, um, they are essential 
to the functioning of authoritarian rule. And they present the leader as a man who's on the one hand is a man of the people. And most of the leaders who came to uh, power by coup, they said that they were coming to power by the will of the people. This is always very important. But at the same time, they are men above all other men. Sometimes they're uh, there by divine accord, or they have some other special quality that makes them men above all other men. And here, uh, this is a billboard, one of the many giant billboards that was in uh, Gaddafi's Libya. And he came to power via military coup. Uh, he, was a, he was a left-wing a socialist revolutionary, so it was the will of the people. And so this is, with you, we embrace greatness. It's supposed to be the voice of the people. So he's buffeted and he's cushioned from below by the people. And yet he's looking at the heavens and he has, of course, his dictator sunglasses on. Dictators love sunglasses and aviators in particular. And so he's looking to the heavens because Gaddafi had this idea that, you know, he wanted to pr propagate that he had divine inspiration. And so um, I interviewed people who lived under him. They said he used to stop in the middle of his speeches and look to the heavens as though he were getting, uh, he was channeling divine in inspiration uh, right then and there. So that's the dual quality, the man of the people and the man above all other men. And one thing, uh, since there are probably history students in here, the specialness of the body and the person, it, it, it plays on things that are very old because in the early modern period, um, monarchs in England and France were thought to have the healing touch and there would be pilgrimage and the king or the queen, if you could touch them, you would be healed from you know, skin diseases and other things. So uh, although, um, so these strong men, there's something of that quality from the early modern period that they are special. And some people felt that um, if they were looked at by the leader, it could cure their ills. So there's that. Another way that um, the strong men called the personality works is that the leader doesn't just represent the nation like in a democracy. He actually embodies the nation so that if you attack him, you're attacking the entire nation. And, and on that basis, uh, anybody like Erdogan in Turkey has all these insult suits, thousands of insult suits. Because when you, if you say something bad about him, you're attacking the entire Turkish nation. But it also works to um, be part of the uh, special allure of the leader because he is, he becomes the literal embodiment of the sorrows and the hopes and the dreams of the people. And so he feels for them, he speaks for them. When Trump said, I am your voice, this is something that's straight from a hundred years of authoritarianism, but he feels for you. And because many of them are very skilled in media, they come from a past of performance or journalism, they know how to make themselves um, the bearer of whatever desires the people have, their, their most inner desires. So this is an interesting, it's an oil painting by uh, John McNaughton. And respect the flag, it refers to, um, he, he's not a fan of the uh, players kneeling, um, uh, NFL kneeling to protest police brutality. But what's of the focus here is Trump, who he clutches a tattered American flag because the honor and the dignity of America are, are, are soiled right, by this practice. And, he, and he's stricken, his face is full of emotion and it's as though he personally is feeling the pain of the people. So this is part of the populist aspect where they come to embody the nation. And this is something that's quite different than democratic with a small d leaders. So I wanted to point out, and it, that, that's important in the model of authoritarian rule. Um, Okay, and so is this idea that they are in office with some kind of heavenly benediction. So I showed you Gaddafi before, um, Mussolini who made peace with the Vatican, um, the Pope, uh, you know, they created uh, the modern Vatican City, restored Catholicism as the official religion of Italy. And the Pope said that 
uh, Mussolini was a man of destiny. He was brought there to save the nation. And at the other end, you have uh, Trump, who is embraced by both Orthodox Jews and evangelical Christians. And uh, one quote among many, where his former White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, said, God wanted Donald Trump to become president. And Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, who is an evangelical, has said things uh, in the same vein. So if we look at propaganda, we're going through some of the tools that they use. And it's really interesting that the strategies of propaganda, the principles of propaganda, have stayed the same, even as the information media have changed a lot. Obviously, now we have social media, didn't have that before. But propaganda now and then, um, it functions via repetition, and the same message uh, with small variations is disseminated across different forms of media. Back then, and here we're in the 30s, it was just TV and radio and print, um, and also saturation. And in a closed society like the one-party dictatorships, it was easier to have this saturation because no alternate voices could be heard. Today, it's a little bit more difficult because either you keep a pocket of opposition media and also because of the way life is and smartphones, et cetera, it's very difficult to have a total vacuum where you don't have any foreign media reaching you. So some, there are different challenges today um, for, for propagandists. So Mussolini used newsreels uh, very effectively. Uh, Bolsonaro uses Twitter. Trump used Twitter, he got banned. And Modi use, is very, very effective at um, using the latest, uh, using social media and digital storytelling. He basically Instagrams his life. Um, and Modi also appears often as a hologram. So he can appear at multiple places at the same time. And this kind of, the hologram kind of symbolizes um, a, a principle that's been with the strong men forever, uh, which is they have to seem omnipotent, all powerful, um, omniscient, they can see everything, omnipresent, they're everywhere, that's the hologram, and infallible, right? So where is my, and here infallible is Mussolini is always right, which was an official slogan of fascist Italy. And this is the entrance to an exhibition. And you see the scale, these are people, and this is the slogan, that's an imperial eagle. Um, so the body, the use of the body politics and machismo and spectacle is really important uh, throughout the hundred years of authoritarian models of rule. And Mussolini was the pioneer here. And uh, the launch of the star system, you know, really influenced the way Mussolini um, presented himself on camera. And, uh, you know, film was silent until the early 30s. So the first decade he was in power, film was silent. So he gesticulated a lot. And he was very, very effective at like he had this gaze that people felt would like go through them. And but he also was the first um, head of state and really the only one until Putin to consistently strip off his shirt for the camera and display his physical prowess, display his body. So here he's threshing wheat and this was a newsreel. So that was his main, uh, so today's Twitter, then it was newsreels. And this is very important uh, because he, so that the, the most effective uh, authoritarian leaders as they embody the nation, they have to speak to many, many constituencies. So they have to be modern, they have to be traditional, they have to reconcile all contradictions. So here Mussolini comes out, he's doing this ancient rite of you know, peasants threshing wheat. And he was from humble uh, beginnings, his father was a blacksmith and he, he never threshed wheat, he was a teacher, but he did come from you know, lower class origins, but he doesn't have the peasant gear on. He's wearing the latest style of goggles. You see, he's got this like modern hat and goggles. So he's modern and he's also traditional. And this was very important, as well as the shock of seeing the head of state arrive for the photo op, strip his shirt off on camera. So it's like a strip tease going on. 
and, and then get to it to have manual labor uh, uh, shirtless on camera. And again, only Putin has done this so consistency, consistently. So they're the two bookmarks you could say. Because uh, Hitler was a, a lot more prudish. And even when he was shoveling soil to mark the start of the Autobahn, he kept his clothes on at all times. So let's see. And um, Trump uh, does not show his own body, but he, this was before he got banned. Uh, interestingly, from his own Twitter accounts, not a retweet, um, he photoshopped or obviously somebody did this for him, his body onto Sylvester Stallone's as Rocky III, but the point is to show the machismo. That's, that's, the, um, that's the kind of through, through line here. All right, we'll show something here. So we don't have to look at that. We'll look at that instead. And the, holog the use of the hologram is extremely, it's extremely important also because um, the modern strongman wants to reach the diaspora. There's a very large Indian diaspora and Modi is extremely skilled at um, performing what he calls his Modi magic um, at rallies all over the world and, and also via hologram. Okay. Now, I also want to talk about um, elites. And this is part of how strongmen get to power <laughs> and how they stay there. Because they, they may think they, they like to think they can do everything themselves, but they are nothing without their enablers. And elites, be it political elites or business elites, financial, religious elites, uh, they make the strongmen happen. And often what happens is you have these outsider characters, as I mentioned before, often have a criminal record, a little iffy, a little sketchy. And it's the elites who introduce them into the system, most famously with Mussolini and Hitler. Uh, you know, conservative elites put them in place and then thought they could control them. And then of course we know what happened. They were not controllable. They ended up controlling everyone else. Um, and why do elites support these people? Well, often, this, it goes back to what I was saying about um, uh, periods of, of, of rapid social progress and people are worried about their status, their class privileges, their earnings. And so uh, influential individuals bring these uh, men into the system thinking they're going to um, do their bidding and also protect their interests. Um, and indeed, uh, authoritarians generally do protect the richest interests. Um, even Mussolini, who was a uh, former socialist, this isn't very well known. As soon as he gets into power as prime minister, he does widespread privatizations. And privatization is one of the most popular things authoritarians do. It's a gift to elites to privatize things. So uh, in the political science literature, it's called the authoritarian bargain that elites strike. And once they sign on, this is a kind of a tragic thing. <laughs> um, once they sign on to, to you know, support the leader, they stick with him to the bitter end, no matter what he says or does, no matter what destruction reigns upon the uh, country. And in Italy and Germany, it took literally being bombed by the allies to, to have this pact start to dissipate. Um, so they hang on through gross mismanagement, through starvation of the populace, through impeachment, um, through insurrectionary behavior, uh, almost anything goes as long as they keep their interests. So that's not a good comment on the elites of the past and present. So um, I stay away from psychological analysis in the book, um, but I do talk about their personalities because they're really important to the authoritarian model of governance. Because these, many of these um, leaders, they install what's known in political science as personalist role. And this is when there's one, obviously one uh, overwhelming power it concentrated in one person. And it can happen even in a, in a democracy where the quirks, the personality, the private financial worries or judicial problems of the ruler come to set domestic and foreign policy. And the leader's personality quirks, um, his paranoia, his hubris, um, whatever his particular traits, and many of them share the same traits, they come to influence the way he does business as, as a leader. 
So all of them follow what's called divide and rule. So they don't want, they're very paranoid and they don't want anyone to get too much power among their aides and their associates and their ministers. So their, um, their, their states often resemble uh, kind of their governance resemble uh, revolving doors where they reshuffle, they fire and they hire. And it's not uncommon for the same person to be fired and rehired and fired and rehired again. But everyone knows that if you're too competent or too popular as a minister, you're going to be demoted, transferred or worse because they're very insecure. Behind their bullying facade, are, they are all very, very insecure. So what they do to protect their power is construct what political scientists call inner sanctums. And I write about this extensively. It's part of the authoritarian model of rule. And these are, it's like an inner circle of cronies, um, usually includes family members. Uh, right now, Erdogan and Orban in Hungary, they have uh, sons-in-law and sons are part of their governance structure. And I have a whole paragraph on sons-in-law who always uh, have um, a prominent position uh, with authoritarian leaders uh, from Ciano with Mussolini up to Jared Kushner. And as I said, in Hungary and in um, Turkey today. And they also have flatterers and cronies because they don't want to hear anything that conflicts with their own views. And so one of the tragedies of authoritarian rule is over time, they end up in a bubble, uh, believing only what they want to believe. They begin to believe in their own propaganda and then they make bad decisions. And that's one reason they all, uh, almost all of them end up badly. So it's, it's reputed to be an efficient style of governance, authoritarianism, but uh, the research I did shows that it's a highly dysfunctional way of ruling and it leads to a lot of destruction. Um, an authoritarian history is full of projects and causes championed by the ruler out of pride and hubris and implemented to disastrous effect. And here's Mussolini right before he entered World War II against the advice of all of his generals. He said, I follow my instincts and I'm never wrong. And when he was removed in July, 1943 by his own grand council because the allies had landed in Sicily because the war was going so badly, he came to work the next day as though nothing had happened because he literally couldn't imagine that he'd been overthrown by his own people. So one of the lessons of, authority, of the concentration of power is that um, you lose all objectivity and you're unable to govern effectively nor to understand when your time is up. <laughs> and this brings us to the chapter I found most interesting to write in some ways, how they fall from power. Because the authoritarian playbook doesn't have a chapter on failure. It doesn't foresee the leaders hold weakening over his people until they turn against him. It doesn't have a page on the horror of being voted out of office, which is unusual, but happened to Augusto Pinochet in Chile, who was pelted with tomatoes and eggs when he attended the inauguration of Chile's first democratic president. None of this was thinkable to the authoritarian or the horror of being forced into exile as happened to Mobutu in the Congo or Idi Amin uh, of Uganda. And democratic heads of state often see the uh, end of their rule, they're voted out and they're gonna do something else. They're gonna have their, you know, curate their legacy, have a library, whatever they're gonna do. But the authoritarian regards the end of his uh, the end of adulation, the end of power and control and immunity from prosecution uh, as an existential threat. And that's why they are supremely unprepared to leave office and they do desperate things once they think their time might be up. Some of them start wars, some of them plan coups and political scientists call this phenomenon gambling for resurrection. <laughs> You're going to do something desperate at the last minute to keep yourself in office and give yourself glory. And almost all autocrats lose the wager. 
So this is an interesting structure uh, uh, and model with which to think about what happened in our country after uh, Trump lost the election, but refused to accept the results. Now, Trump didn't wreck democracy. He was an authoritarian minded president who ruled within an open society. Indeed, he was voted out. But he never intended to govern as a democratic president with a small d. Um, he was never interested in public welfare, which is one reason he mismanaged the pandemic, or bipartisan governance. He was only interested in people who voted for Trump. And his main goal was to turn public office into a money-making operation for Trump organization, which is why he spent one out of every three days going to visit a Trump property. So this was the promoting his brand. And he also needed to spread hatred and keep Americans polarized. So the events of January 6th, um, we're still you know, digesting this momentous event. And they were a wake up call for, uh, for many people to the dangers that Trump represents, many, many high military officials, security officials. Um, and they showed to what extent America has been, American democracy has been an honor system that we have abided by customs and eth ethical rules and other procedural rules, including the idea that the loser of an election would give the winner the respect of vacating office. And so we should pay careful attention to the methods that Trump and the GOP used because the GOP has played through all of this, the role of the classic elite enablers. Um, they fit the textbook, the, the authoritarian bargain model I trace. They fit it perfectly. And we should pay attention to what has happened in these last uh, months because um, it can become normalized into the way that GOP does business, whether or not Trump is there. So we already see um, the voter suppression laws now going on, a big, a big slew of them. This is clearly the GOP is investing in voter suppression, and this is related to Trump further legitimizing this longstanding practice with what he did after he lost the election. So, you know, he tried this trick that uh, authoritarians he uh, admires, like Erdogan and Putin, already have institutionalized, which is this 21st century electoral autocracy, where you have elections, but you turn them into something you can manipulate. So as we know, he was trying to pressure the Georgia Secretary of State to find votes and all the other history that's familiar to you. And the key here, and this works with propaganda, uh, elect, even election results, so nothing is sacred, even election results that don't go your way become just another piece of information to be denied and replaced with a fabrication that suits the false reality you need to stay in power. And this is what happens all over the world with uh, in 21st century autocracies. So when we think about that, so he tried that, and that's part of this, again, this authoritarian uh, menu he also channeled kind of early fascism in calling on these extremists to come to this rally. And I just want to focus here on um, the importance of the followers. And for followers of an authoritarian who is going down or has been voted out, is, is supposed to be gone, it's an extremely volatile time because some of them, their whole world is oriented around the leader and they can become very unstable, unsettled. And also they can do desperate things. They can be gambling for resurrection as well. So the propaganda that autocrats like Orban and Erdogan and Trump have used is about them as a victim. And so they are always appealing for their people to rescue them when need be. And so January 6th was really a rescue operation of a leader in distress. And they believed that he had won the election, they were restoring him something that was rightfully his. Um, so it's very important, the last point that at the rally, which as you know, was uh, uh, the focus of the, the claim that he was inciting violence that was around impeachment, 
it wasn't just about inciting violence. It's very important for the logic of authoritarianism that he told his followers at the rally and also at a video he released while the assault was going on, that he loved them. He said, I love you, you're very special, and our journey together is just beginning. So the incitement has focused on, logically so given the outcome of police being killed, uh, has focused on the violence, but the incitement was also the expression of love because the history of authoritarianism is also how do you get people to commit violence on your behalf? Because you're not personally committing the violence. You're getting others to commit violence for you in your name. And to do that, they have to feel loved by you. They have to feel special and elevated. So all authoritarians have been very, very good at creating these communities of believers who feel special at being part of that community. And the history of authoritarian violence is tied in with this. And this was just a small uh, example of what can happen. So I want to focus on that because it doesn't get talked about, the fact that he told them he loved them and they were special. So it's not surprising to conclude that the last, they, they were shown a propaganda film at the rally right before they went to the Capitol. And this was the final frame of the film. So as they walked toward the Capitol from the rally, this was what followed them. And so here we have the leader cult. <laughs> so this is one reason I wrote the book Strongmen, which is about grassroots followers. It's about elite enablers. It's about institutions, but it's focused on how this eternal question of how, these, how certain individuals can can uh, create charismatic bonds with their with millions of people and get them to do things in their name. So, and that's the that's one of the essences of authoritarian rule. So, I'll stop there. So, Professor Ben Gia, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So, we have several questions, and I'll just uh, start uh, with some of them and see if we can maybe fold a few of them together. Uh, one of the questions came up about uh, social change and disruption, because you use that as background to talk about how strong men often emerge. And one of the questions came up about, well, it's easy enough, I guess, to see the disruption of the 1920s and 30s. But the question was about the, the 26, the, the, in the United States, the background of the pre-2016. Yeah. Is it, could you amplify a little bit on that point? And is it of the same kind or... I mean, they, people just wanted to, one, one or two people wanted to flush that, that issue yeah. out. No, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Um, it's never the same because history never repeats exactly in the same way. Um, so what is, there are recurrences. So for example, we were in hindsight, perfectly set up for um, a Trumpian figure uh, in part because um, you had had eight years of a presidency by an African-American and many people were not ready to, they didn't think he should have ever been president. Um, and this is part of the racism. It's inextricable from the racism. And, and Trump uh, has always been a racist, but he read the, he's a marketer. He read the political market and he, he really decided to cultivate racist extremists as part of his brand. But during Obama's eight years, some of the things he had done. Now he was actually in foreign policy and in terms of mass detention, you know, uh, he was more of a hawk than, than uh, he was allowed to be publicly, let's say by the GOP. But think of some of the social changes that came. Same sex marriage was legalized. And in the entire history of authoritarianism, uh, persecution of LGBTQ people is, is, a, is a through line. So same-sex marriage, which today, you know, in Poland and Hungary, they're doing their best to an anti-trans, uh, you know, persecution of trans people. You also had gender integration in the military, 2013, um, that women could go into combat. And this, so there were a lot of things that happened in terms of social progress and the new visibility of many African-American officials, the diversity of the cabinet. And so what seemed like half of America uh, as great progress was to another half a uh, disaster, apocalypse, right? And this is why the uh, 
the, the focus on demographics, which was already present in the right from the Tea Party, et cetera, it was hugely souped up at this time. And you, now you have, it's become so mainstream, you have Tucker Carlson on Fox News talking about white replacement theory, right? Which is just straight up, you know, from the history of fascism. The fear that you will be replaced by non-white people, which is not only um, about population changing, but losing status, losing jobs. So Trump was very uh, successful in appealing to people who's, who either they're psychologically, they felt threatened or their jobs had dried up, right? And so they were in distress and they felt no one was looking out for them of either party, actually. And Trump went in and said, you are forgotten no more. And he was quite brilliant in his appeal to the emotions uh, in a way that past and, and other current strongmen are too. This persuasiveness, this seeming to be very authentic in taking unto himself the needs of the forgotten. So that's some of the background when, and really we were, we were very w- well placed to end up uh, in this situation. I'm not saying that approvingly, I'm saying it like historically. <laughs> Okay, um, the questions are coming uh, fast and furious. So uh, there were a couple of questions about Orban in, in Hungary and uh, whether he fits, uh, how he fits into this uh, authoritarian model and a couple of people querying the idea of whether there's something different and maybe even unique there in this kind of illiberal liberalism that he often talks about or- Yeah, Ill- illiberal you know, democracy. Yeah, or Western, Western decadence. And one of the questions related to that was about what, <laughs> what should the EU do since Hungary is an EU state? Uh, there's all the questions of money and support. So uh, how would you comment on him and sort of the current, current state of uh, the EU and its politics? <laughs> so Orban is very, very interesting because again, everybody, um, everyone uses this authoritarian playbook in a different manner. And it's never gonna look the same. So I wanna be very clear. For example, my book is not saying that Trump is Hitler, that Trump is this, it's nobody is anybody else. Everybody has their own um, way of being an authoritarian that plays on their country's history, right? So, so in Hungary, this mm-hmm. Hungary, his slogan, which has been very successful and worked for him, that about illiberal democracy. Now, honestly, the guy now rules by decree. There's nothing democratic about what he's doing, but it's a very good slogan because it keeps him able to, to, I think it's a total disgrace that he's getting even one penny from or one Euro from the EU because he has domesticated the judiciary. He's, He's bought out the press. He's, it's not a free society anymore. It's just not. So if the EU uh, is supposed to stand for democratic principles, they shouldn't be subsidizing him. That's my personal view. But Orban's also important because he he gives voice to this um, strain within authoritarianism that goes back to Mussolini. Mussolini was the first to say liberal democracy is finished and um, what you think is democracy is actually tyranny. It's the tyranny of materialism. It's the tyranny of mob rule. And he said, this is back in the twenties that fascism was going to you know, preserve this kind of measured freedom, but everything within the state. So Orban continues this idea of saying, we're renegotiating democracy for a new age. It's a liberal democracy. And he also often talks about how liberal democracy is tyranny. So they're flipping the script and you see this a lot and Putin does this as well. Um, And with that comes this check it off, check it off roster of authoritarian tactics where you've got greater Hungary talks about, so you have expansionism, but you also have the nation as the bulwark against migrants coming in, against you know, cosmopolitan influences and, and the, a particularity of Hungary is the obsession with, you know, Soros and what is his old friend who used to support him, 
George Soros. Um, I mean, there's anti-Semitism as part of the, the authoritarian playbook everywhere. But in Hungary, it takes the form, you know, the Soros obsession, right? And Soros standing for globalism. And one of the hypocrisies of these guys is that they, they rail against globalists. And then all of them depend on foreign uh, financial networks or offshore networks that are exquisitely globalist to hide their money. Uh, so they want to have it both ways. And Orban's been actually pretty... The fact he's still getting EU money is a sign of how skilled he's been uh, at this game. Okay, I'll, I'll venture in here with two really large questions. And then uh, one is about the relationship between this authoritarianism, as you've been describing it, and religious culture and religious practice. And the specific question within that was about Mussolini and his kind of complicated relationship with the Catholic Church, uh, you know, was used forming the Lateran Pact and things like that on the one hand, but professing atheism uh, personally. Um, so that's one huge issue. And then the question, uh, quite fascinating, is what do you see as kind of cultural, economic, social practices that would make for healthier democratic societies so that uh, the emergence of strongmen would be less likely? So, um, yeah, the religion question is very, very interesting. Um, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the personality cult and the specialness of the body is that it, it, sometimes um, the, these men become kind of, this sounds banal, like, you know, substitute gods, or they become substitute objects of veneration. Mussolini is very, very interesting because Unlike Hitler, you know, Mussolini was the first one to do this along with the early communists and Mussolini studied Lenin. And, but it's important to know that, you know, Lenin dies in 1924 and then Stalin doesn't come consolidate his power till 28. So Mussolini is kind of doing this by himself. He's working out the template of, of how to be this. And he had a rival uh, infallible authority inside Italy, which was the Pope. So nobody else had the Pope inside their country. <laughs> um, so he negotiated this very well. And, you know, no one was more not only personally atheist, but professionally anti-clerical than Mussolini. He'd written a novel about um, a cardinal who had a mistress. He hated the church. But the thing about strongmen is that they are totally amoral and they're totally transactional. And that's why they are able to make deals with anyone. And that's also why, you know, they'll say X in the morning and, and negative X in the afternoon. They, they don't care. So they end up with these constituencies that are like priests and gangsters and, and, and Berlusconi was the same and Trump's the same. They, they end up with these people who are, are very disparate. But it's also interesting that the most um, profane and, and, and non-pious individuals are the ones who have the most effective deals <laughs> with religious authorities. And so Mussolini laid down this, this model uh, in, in being the one to solve the church state problem and create Vatican City. And, and he did that very successfully. And Putin has as well. I mean, Putin is like an international mafioso and kills people. And he has um, had very, a very good arrangement with the Orthodox Church, where the state actually has been restoring for a long time now, been restoring Orthodox churches and paying for these expensive restorations. And the whole kind of uh, culture of uh, Russian nationalism is something that's an area where they go together. All of these right wing in Poland to the church can get on board with this. There's many points of communality. And that's also where tragically this gives double force to the anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ, anti anything that's not normative. So you have church and state working together in all of these, um, all of these uh, new authoritarian states uh, against these variety of enemies. So the other question, the small question, how to protect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, it, 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 I mean, there are some things that are globally valid. Uh, one of them is 
what do we do about social media, about these privately owned social media companies that are the biggest aggregators and accelerators of anti-democratic propaganda around the world? What do we do with that? Now, it's a huge, huge deal that Twitter took Trump out because uh, two days ago, the New York Times came out. They did some one of these vast data analysis. And the one individual who had who was the biggest source of uh, false information, disinformation about COVID was Donald Trump. Um, And so taking that one individual off of Twitter um, already was, you know, helping the problem. But that's just like a needle in a haystack. I mean, he was he was the, the president. So it was a huge deal and not repeated in Brazil, Bolsonaro who's another factory of disinformation about COVID is still on there. So that's one thing that, you know, many of them are seeded in America, the the companies, but that's universal. Otherwise each experience, you know, every time these people uh, come to power, they reveal all of the weaknesses in the democratic system, whatever, wherever it is. And, also all of the longings like Bolsonaro, um, one of the many reasons he has uh, not shocked people, but he played very openly on nostalgia for the Brazilian dictatorship. So here we have make the nation great again. In I meant to say this before in Brazil, the great again is unfortunately the Brazilian military dictatorship. So he legitimized this longing for this law and order repressive. And it took some Brazilians by surprise. Others were not surprised at all. So wherever they come, they, it's like they reveal all the weaknesses of the system, but that also gives us a roadmap of what to fix. So in our country, um, I think that the experience, the reason I wanted to end with uh, what happened in America after the election that's a kind of roadmap to some of the things that need to be addressed. So, you know, there's always been a debate about the electoral college as not being very democratic, but I'm concerned as somebody in, in who studies, you know, anti-democracy, look what happened. Um, this, the, the smaller number of people who are effectively deciding on an election, if you have authoritarians in office, it hugely increases the intimidation and threat potential to those few people. You can't intimidate an entire nation into not voting. They're trying with voter suppression, but you can intimidate hundreds of electors. The smaller the number of people, the more they're at risk. Another thing that we saw uh, that needs to be addressed, uh, and first it, it goes with the electoral college, is very few other countries leave such a long space in between the election in November and the inauguration in January. And you see what can happen in those months. <laughs> Trump had a lot of time to try and stay in office. And that, that's where we go back to the honor system. So there are structural things. Um, there are there's on the other end, we've, and many people have embraced the idea of vetting political ca- presidential candidates. They have to, they should have to show their tax returns. They should have to um, show their foreign interests. Um, all of that kind of transparency measures, those are very important. So on that end, on the other end, there are all kinds of reforms and, and but each society has their own. Okay. So uh, a few people are asking the question, I'm sure you've heard several times that in your book, you're focusing on uh, right authoritarian leaders and they're querying the why, idea. Yeah. Why, why are that, there no left ones? Right. Uh, yes. And yes. So that's been asked several times in a few ways. I think I should give you the, them the opportunity to voice that issue. Absolutely. The opportunity to respond to it. That uh, There was a particular question about Fidel Castro, I think. Yeah. And, yeah, so um, I have a lot of people in the book, and um, uh, I am a historian of fascism, and I was interested, given the things that, um, I was interested in the legacy of right-wing authoritarianism primarily. 
So everybody in the book, and that's just a decision I made um, in the introduction, I say clearly, I also made it because uh, I'm mostly, I'm interested in people who wrecked a democracy or who damaged a democracy. So for example, I wasn't gonna have North Korea and China where the, the society is already closed when the person takes over. Um, there isn't a democracy. So I decided to, on that basis, um, um, that was one reason. The other reason is I, I really wanted to show the through lines so that fascism may have ended in 1945 in you know flame out way in the war, but I wanted to show how neo-Nazis and neo-fascists went to, like Francisco Franco is in my book. There's a ton of, there's a lot about him. And he's not always figured in as much as he should be. And so they went to Franco Spain. And then when Franco died, they went, you know, they were also elsewhere in Paraguay and other places uh, in the Americas, but they went to Chile. Um, they went to Pinochet. And and also the line with Bolsonaro and Operation Condor and all of this thing that goes up to, and then there were neo-fascists who ended up with, in Berlusconi's Italy when Berlusconi brought the far right into power for the first time. So I wanted to show that, I wanted to tell that story. Um, had I added, Castro fits 100%, obviously. There are many left-wing authoritarians who do the same terrible things. Right. So it wasn't an argument that uh, only uh, only going to talk about the right and not talk about the left. That would be dumb. But it was simply a, it was more, let's say, a narrative. It was a narrative thing. And also um, I wanted to show people who really wrecked a democracy. And, and that was on that basis. That's how I included or excluded. OK, so another big question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, question about social media has come up on several different ways that is you connected um, a trajectory about propaganda of you know, Mussolini going forward. Uh, and, and you referenced the fact that we're in a very different kind of regime, a very different landscape. Um, how does one negotiate, you know, in this world of social media where uh, messages can be obviously sent to millions of followers and millions of non-followers at you know, the speed of light. It complicates, it seems, everything that you say about you know, all, all parts of this, how people come into power, how they maintain and rule power, how they fall. And since there's another question kind of related to that, um, are there instances of, of strong men who are, uh, they lose power and then they become political actors on the sidelines waiting for their return? <laughs> Uh, and what happens in those kinds of cases? <laughs> um, yeah, those are two separate questions. The, the social media, um, it's, I think, as I said before, it accelerates, social media accelerates all of the core principles of propaganda. You know, repetition, saturation, all of it is souped up and accelerated by the operation of social media. So, so but, but in fact, the, the, it's a double-edged sword for autocrats because, and, and the case of um, Russia is very interesting. And I, I talk, so I have this whole chapter on resistance in the book and it goes over a hundred years, like all the chapters. And it was very uh, inspiring to write and very interesting in terms of social media, because we know the Russians have a hundred years of propaganda experience. They're highly skilled. Uh, I'm teaching a class of propaganda right now. And we just read, uh, about the quote fire hose of falsehood model, where you just it's volume, um, you know, volume and uh, all kinds of other principles that are just uh, very intense uh, and and very successful because of that. So uh, between that and also you know blocking social media platforms, all of the things that uh, autocrats do, they've they've made it into one of their tools for sure, but. Resistors and dissenters have all also used uh, social media very effectively on their own. So in Putin's Russia, um, one one of the uh, mm -hmm. one of the classic resistance um, scenarios is the police knocking on your door. And for as long as there's been you know people dissenting, you have to hide your documents so your contacts don't get discovered. There are these you know panic scenes, right? 
And this was a scene that you wouldn't see. You would, you would read about it in an exile's memoir, or you'd read about it after the regime fell, or you might be a neighbor and you'd hear the knocking on the door and hide. But now in Putin's Russia, there are um, dissidents who stream on video the police knocking on their door and their arrests, and they stream it on Twitter. And this, this practice has started also in Arab Spring of narrativizing through social media your acts of resistance and the state's oppression of you. And it's been very effective at creating what are like called you know, communities of empathy, communities of solidarity around practices of dissent and resistance. Um, so like another in 2019, when there was a raid on all of the Alexei Navalny, uh, the guy who is being slowly killed in prison now, um, all of his associates had their homes raided. And many of them streamed on Twitter or other means, the police coming in. And one of them, he, he had a very inventive solution to the problem of his contacts. So he had a drone and he put his hard drive inside the drone and he, it's on Twitter and he, he, um, he streamed it going out of this window of his apartment to a friend's house. <laughs> so the police took him away, but didn't get his hard drive. And this went viral. So it's a double-edged thing. Mm. Um, and unless they're going to pre completely prevent internet, it, it's difficult for them to, to shut that down. Okay. So here's a different question. Um, somebody's asking about the, the more particular relationship between gender and authoritarianism. And if you could conceive of the emergence of a strong woman. Yeah. If, is that... A, if so, what kinds of what kinds of ideas that you've already been talking about tonight might apply, and what might be different uh, yeah. in that kind of conception? So you know, uh, authoritarianism has been a salvation of patriarchy operation for a hundred years, and I write at one point in the book that women are uh, have been the enemy as much as prosecutors and journalists, right? But, and that's why I included the chapter on machismo and virility and sexual exploitation. Um, Cause that's, I wanted that to be taken seriously because often in political science, we, there's very good analysis of corruption or elites but they don't have, it's, they don't analyze masculinity in, in a way. And, and it's really one of the tools of rule. So given that um, the question of, can there be a strong woman is interesting. And, and in my book, I uh, don't, I didn't treat female leaders. There are people like Indira Gandhi or Golda Meir who had, or Margaret Thatcher had certain qualities, but they didn't wreck democracies. They did the liberal things. But they didn't wreck democracies. And I also wanted to capture this moment of uh, strongman rule because a lot of these guys are not very young. Um, Putin may keep doing his plastic surgery, but they're all getting older. And so at some point, and none of them can talk about successors because that's the problem. That's why they don't leave well. They can't have any successors, but they will, they will go. And so I wanted to have like a snapshot of this particular style of rule. Now that said, I, in the conclusion, I say that we will have a female-led authoritarian state in the future um, because the far right, there's lots of prominent women um, and in our country too, but in, in Europe, there's always been. Now, right now, you know, a lot of the polls are showing uh, Le Pen in France as doing better than the other camps, prospective candidates. She's a little bit of an exception because the, the reason she is so, was so prominent for so long is because her father was the founder of the movement. Because in the past, and she's older than some of the younger you know, far right women. It was difficult for women because these are these are sexist, uh, misogynist uh, uh, amb ambience circumstances, and it was hard for women of her generation to 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 get there. And she had her father; she inherited her father's you know throne, let's say. But she could be the first one now. Whoever it is, whether it's her or Ivanka Trump or whoever the heck it's going to be, um, they're not going to be stripping their shirt off. The machismo thing would would not be there, but uh, I conclude that everything else would be the same. The racism, the sexism, 
the uh, anti-LGBTQ on the I'm family friendly, but it's a certain kind of family only that we will allow. The repression, all of it will be the same. So um, it's not having women in the book is not, a, is not a statement that, you know, like only men can do this. Um, men have a particular, they've had a particular formation of power and part of the macro argument of the book is that we've been enamored of this kind of toxic male power. We've fetishized this certain kind of brutalist glamour. Um, but that doesn't mean that if a woman comes in, it's not going to be repressive toward migrants and uh, gay people, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, there's also a question asking for you to amplify on your, your views of um, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. Um, kind of common, again, combination of a populist authoritarian, um, but from a mil military background, et cetera. So the question just came up about whether you would be able to sort of expand on your views of where, where he fits. Yeah, he, he fits perfectly. Um, everything from coming in uh, as an anti-corruption uh, you know, reformer supposedly, and again, there were the there were corruption scandals. So he came in as somebody who was full of rectitude by being in the military. He was going to clean up, uh, and so then he had Sergio Mora, who had been a prosecutor. He had him early on, and so that seemed to you know to kind of state his intentions. Of course, uh, I, I just started a newsletter uh, on the company Substack called Lose It. And my first essay was called Drain the Swamp. And it was about how, you know, these people come in as anti-corruption reformers and then they are extremely corrupt themselves. Um, and he's no exception and his you know, sons are very corrupt. And, and so he's got this kind of, again, this inner circle of family, of relatives. It's the same governance model, um, the use of propaganda. Uh, Bolsonaro is also extremely savvy with his use of media. And he does something, remember I mentioned before about the body and how they use their bodies as, rep, as they embody the nation. And he's been very interesting in his, um, I call it faux or false transparency. So when he was campaigning for president, he, uh, he, there was an assassination attempt on him. And he's, he had to go to the hospital obviously. And then he's had health effects you know, recurrent and he has to go to the hospital for these treatments. And every time he's in the hospital, he makes sure to um, tweet videos, stream videos in his hospital gown, hooked up to monitors. Like we all see the familiar tray tables, everything we all have when we go to the hospital, if we go, God forbid. And in this way, he seems to be a, a transparent, approachable body. He's the body of the nation. And he also uh, is a real tough guy, military, he's a man's man, he's totally homophobic, he's you know, sexist, and yet he seems vulnerable. And this is something that uh, the modern strongman does very well, the contemporary strongman. They make themselves vulnerable even as they're bullies. So he's been extremely savvy in managing his uh, persona. Um, at the same time, he, he's been... <laughs> He's threatened violence from, this is from when he was, uh, you know, on his, pres his campaign, right? So he's, he, I, he's a very, very frightening individual. Um, this letting the genie out of the Brazilian dictatorship and making it uh, okay to, you know, praising torturers. Th this is all part of the playbook, but it's, it's very dire. And most of all, he shows that authoritarians have zero interest in public welfare. Um, and they would rather do what is necessary to keep their ratings up, even if it means massive disinformation continuing about uh, the pandemic. And Brazil is in a nightmare state right now, uh, in part because of his consistent disinformation um, uh, and, and personal modeling of bad behavior. It's, it's, really, it's really very tragic what's going on there now. So he fits. <laughs> And, and that's not a compliment to him. Okay, another one of these difficult overarching questions about um, connections you might see between like concentration of wealth and you know fewer and fewer uh, hands 
business concentration, et cetera. Is this a background issue, would you say, for the kinds of things that you study? Or is it a development that goes hand in hand? Somebody used the term, I guess, it's this soft non-governmental authoritarianism brought on by a concentration of, of business uh, yeah. wealth and I guess private wealth. I don't, I don't think that was in the question itself. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is about form, forming oligarchies. Um, Putin has perfected it the most with a, he has a true kleptocracy. In 2019, uh, 3% of the country owned 89% of the wealth. And one thing uh, I, I have written about, and I interviewed uh, for my Lucid newsletter, Bill Browder, William Browder, who um, was the largest foreign investor with hedge funds in the Soviet Union. And his business was plundered by Putin. And this is an aspect of authoritarianism that goes under the radar outside of the countries. But uh, Erdogan does it too and Orban too, they, the state will plunder any profitable businesses and uh, you will be forced into exile. You are forced to sell at a very low price or it's, it's, you know, it's a kind of, um, uh, they call it predation in Russia at, at, from the word pred predator. And uh, this is an aspect of um, the business policies of authoritarians that we don't hear about enough because Although big capital always does well under authoritarians, if, especially if you're in oil or big pharma, uh, you can get, you know, you, and you benefit from privatizations, but medium-sized businesses and foreign-owned businesses, they can become very easily targets of predatory behavior. So uh, over 70,000, this seemed, I had to triple check, fact check this because it seemed Crazy, but it's true. Over 70,000 business people have been arrested and harassed by Putin. Um, it, the scale of it is astonishing. And Erdogan has seized uh, schools and closed schools and businesses worth $32 billion. So these states are um, plunderers. They plunder bodies, they plunder assets, um, and they become... Uh, criminal operations. And, and of course, there's many people who work on this full time on corruption, who, who show that, you know, uh, that, that authoritarian states become, you know, criminal, criminal operations, um, some more successfully than others. Uh, but that's, that's something we don't, we don't hear about it enough. And it's enabled by all the foreign banks and foreign PR firms and um, who do business with them, who give them loans who prop them up, and and this we if we to address the question from before of how do we stop this, if if the big foreign enablers are not going to change their ways, it's very difficult. Okay, uh, another question here about the relationship between I think uh, professional militaries and authoritarians, um, and the person is referencing in particular the case in Pakistan. And I guess probably in a contemporary setting, although they didn't specify, I think that's a fairly large question that might go across your your, your models of what's the relationship you see between like it, you know, pre-existing professional military bodies and authoritarian strongmen or strongmen as they reach out to form new relationships with professional militaries. Yeah, I can't really answer that so well. I don't really know much about Pakistan, but it also, it hugely depends if there's traditions of military coups and how the new person coming in is, uh, how they are positioned towards those coups, yeah. um, towards those military dictatorships. Um, again, Bolsonaro is a very clear case of, uh, you know, being very positive about the dictatorship and all of its practices. Um, but, it's interesting, there aren't that many military coups today. I mean, in Myanmar, we have one that's you know, very recent, but they were, military coups were responsible for 75% of failures of democracy globally since World War II. Um, and, and, and in the States, for example, we, we, don't, we didn't have the vocabulary to talk about military coups. And that's a, very, that's a chapter that's going to be very, very interesting 
uh, in future histories um, because Trump was clearly from the summer exploring some kind of military intervention. And then he used General Millet, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a prop uh, in the summer when they were uh, repressing the Black Lives Matter protests. And uh, Millet came out uh, after the election and said, the armed forces is loyal to the constitution and not to a person, not to an individual. And it was clear like who he meant. So that was shut down, but it was being explored. <laughs> so even in our country, which doesn't have a tradition of coups, <laughs> um, authoritarians will like explore that issue. But it, it's very, very, it, I, I can't answer the question anymore specifically because it's, it's very specific to the country and whether their military uh, has participated in such things in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe a couple last questions as we are kind of approaching time here. Um, this is another big question, but since we're in this kind of forum where we're you know, trying to have a open, large conversation, um, do you think there's the tolerance for authoritarianism, maybe both domestically and uh, globally has increased? And uh, a couple of questions about like, it's, it seems like, you know, the, the reaction time for how people process these things is, is much shorter now. And then you come back into a, a cycle of, you know, the same kind of messaging going on. So do you think there's a higher toleration or more acceptance or is it, a, a, you know, a feeling of like just fatigue in democratic processes or something like that? Um, and then I have at least one more question I want to ask you, but, um, Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, people who are studying why there's this new surge of authoritarianism uh, sometimes do see a fatigue with democratic processes. Um, but there's interesting research. Um, uh, Karen Stenner, S-T-E-N-N-E-R, in 2005, published a book, and there's been subsequent research confirming it, uh, that about anywhere at any time, about 30% of the population has authoritarian inclinations. Now, these are often measured by um, how they feel about the family or about state institutions. It doesn't have to be about, you know, what did you think about Mussolini? Nothing that specific. And the point is that at, at the right person or circumstances can come along, but it's usually because authoritarianism doesn't always have to have a leader, one leader like their, like the Brazilian dictatorship was a junta and in which there wasn't one like Pinochet, like in Chile, there was Pinochet, right? And so he quickly took over the junta and it was just all about him. But in Brazil, you didn't have that one figure. So, but often a figure comes along, a charismatic figure and and activates this um, authoritarianism that's been dormant. And in other circumstances would express itself in other areas of society, but not politically. So the, this line of thought, just to talk about America, holds that um, this got activated. And then Trump from the very beginning, 2015, he starts signaling to extremists, he starts signaling to racists. Uh, my earliest pieces about Trump for CNN were from 2015. Um, as soon as he started doing that, I was like, uh-oh, that's not good, <laughs> not good at all. So I started writing about it. And, and you, cult, you have to cultivate this because, but the fact that the pop, there is a part of the population that already feels this way um, even in a place that has never had a history of national dictatorship, like we haven't had a national dictatorship or a foreign occupation, but you still see how people can become cultivated if there's somebody who knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and there it's very important that um, although Trump came from business and reality TV, the people who surrounded him, he, he surrounded himself with people who had worked for decades for authoritarians who were expert in psychological warfare, in election rigging, Paul Manafort, pa Roger Stone had a lobbying firm and they worked for numerous dictators for, for decades. Steve Bannon, years of right, far right propagandist, very, actually very effective propagandist, um, 
whole psychological warfare strike at the state um, that was activated when Trump first came in with the ban on travel from Muslim countries. So, so th this is one example of how it can happen. And, and it took people by surprise because the, the cherished myth about America was supposed to be that it can't happen here. And so when, when authoritarians come in, it's a time when uh, country after country has to interrogate themselves and say, well, oh, our cherished myths are falling by the wayside. We thought we weren't going to be like this. And indeed, we are like this. Okay. Well, just a couple minutes left. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll try to frame this as a, a couple of the people in the Q&A have done. If you want to have this discussion, since you are uh, very much in the public with these uh, issues, and you want to engage uh, people who were studying the same phenomena, but also had different views on these things, and you're yeah. putting together your own panel, uh, who would they be? Who would, the, who would that include? Like if somebody came to you and said, you know, I, I want a reasonable spectrum of opinion about the authoritarianism, the hundred years that you've been talking about, uh, like soft, even hard critics of your positions, I guess, in fairness, you're academic, you always know that there are people there uh, that have different positions on these things. So questions come up a few times, like who would, who would those contemporary voices be that you would want to just engage in a, in a conversation? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know exactly who it would be. Um, I, I often on TV and, and in panels, I was put together with people who like Shadi uh, Hamid, who didn't believe at all that Trump was an authoritarian and thought it was like really ridiculous to even talk about him in that way. And I like that. I like doing those debates. <laughs> it, it's if you're just if you're just listening to people who think like you, what, what's the point of that? It, 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 and there's no point. But one of the problems with polarization is that we have now um, is that you know people have become much more extreme and. Uh, some of the work I do is, you know, important. It's important to build bridges. Like I, I am, you know, I'm not a far left person. I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal and I'm pro-military. Um, and I think that's, for example, a point of uh, that many, many of us can, can come together on the importance of strong national security, strong military. Um, and so, so that, that would be a you know, something, but I don't know of individual people. Um, there, sadly, the, the GOP doesn't have much place for moderates nowadays. Um, the few moderates uh, have, have been kind of sidelined, like Mitt Romney. Um, and, and the GOP has evolved into really a far right party. Uh, and, and there's a lot of very scary extremist individuals uh, in there right now. And that, that's very, that's very sad. It's very sad for our democracy. Uh, and, and in particular, because after January 6th, with Trump out of office, they are on the way out, they easily could have uh, kind of disavowed him and gone back to a centrist, uh, more, more centrist position. And instead, they doubled down and now are kind of saying that, you know, not only it was justified and and it was uh, not violent, it was peaceful and trying to kind of negate all the things that are so well documented. And that's not gonna end up, uh, that's not putting us in, in a good place because when you only have two parties and one of them becomes a far right party that espouses violence, because when, when every time they are standing up for, for Trump, they're telling you that they approve of violence as a way of staying in power because that's what January 6th was, a coup attempt. Um, and that's, so, so moderate voices, I would love to have them. Um, and sometimes on radio shows, I don't remember their names. I've done uh, over 300 interviews in the last years. Uh, I am put with people from conservative think tanks and I really like that. I, I think that's, it's very, very important. It's important for me, uh, I get a lot out of it, but it's very important for listeners and viewers to see that dialogue, that civil dialogue going on. Um, and I would gladly go on Fox News if I, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit dangerous to do so these days. Um, it, and, but I think it, we also have to 
Uh, we can't just sit in our silos. That's not good for democracy either. That sounds like a very good point to end on in our, yeah. uh, our kind of tradition of you know, liberal arts college. Uh, we want to emphasize that, that point too. So I'm going to take the final opportunity to thank you, uh, Professor R uh, Ruth ben Giat from NYU. I want to also thank by name um, the, the various people here at the college who've made this possible. So bear with me because this was a really large effort on our part. Uh, so I'm going to thank Professor Dina Lowy from the International and Global Studies uh, Program. Um, thank Professor Stephen Stern from Jewish Studies, Lydia Anchisi from Italian Studies, Carolyn Hartzell from Political Science, Scott Hancock from my home department history, Rob Boyer, who uh, is from the Eisenhower Institute, and especially want to thank, uh, and Ruth ben yeah, will know exactly how this works, the people who really make this possible, the people behind the scenes, Kevin Lavery from uh, the Eisenhower Institute, who's become the webinar master here at the mm -hmm. college, and a very strong shout out, as it were, to Triada Chavez, uh, in uh, IGS, International Global Studies, who did all the logistical work for us in preparation for tonight. Thank you all very much for joining us. Please look for a whole wide variety of programming through the Gettysburg, Co through Gettysburg College and the Eisenhower Institute. And have a good evening. Please everybody stay safe and healthy. That's really very important these days. Uh, good night. Thank you.